And tonight you are all here for um, the book launch and release of Peronetta, uh, Benjamin Boxiera's new book, the sequel to Barrio Bushido. How exciting, it's so, so exciting. We're so happy and honored to be able to celebrate him. So we wanna welcome you to the unceded land, the Ohlone people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards on the lands in which we reside. Um, we also want to acknowledge the painful situation our country remains in with Black Lives Matter and systemic racism and police brutality and violence and killings and know that our library is not a neutral institution. We stand in solidarity and we are working on our own systemic racism. The link that I put in the document has lots of resources about indigenous land, indigenous land rights, um, and Black Lives Matter and Black Joy and Black Art. And so check that out. We also want to acknowledge and celebrate that we are celebrating not only this great book, but um, Viva, uh, Viva. So it is Latinx Heritage Month. Part of this celebration is this book. We have lots of authors coming up as well, lots of art. Um, I'm gonna breeze through a lot of this. This is the De Young Museum. Much art, much celebration. Um, another mission, uh, art, another mission uh, district resident, Calixto Robles will be doing a Day of the Dead, uh, a history and storytelling of his life in Oaxaca and how they celebrated Day of the Dead. And that one will be in Spanish. So we encourage you to come to all of these great programs couple library announcements. One City, One Book this year will be Chanel Miller's Know My Name. Um, you can pick this up now at our on the line Friends of the Library bookstore or the library or your favorite local bookstore. It's a great and heavy and important read. So pick it up now. You might need to um, put it down, come back to it. It's a little bit heavy, but it's an important topic. And Chanel will be with us mid-March for a virtual program. So we encourage you to read it now. We'll have some book clubs and a lot of programs surrounding this book as well. SFPL to go, we are out there. Six locations now, four more coming in mid-October. You can place your holds up and go pick them up from our library family who's out there working in the streets daily. Please mask up, protect my library family, protect all our city workers, all of our um, citizen workers, community workers, health workers, food service workers that serve us on a daily out in the streets. Wear your mask. And don't forget to vote. Re last day to register to vote, um, October 19th, register to vote. We thank our friends of the San Francisco Public Library always. Um, I am so honored tonight. I can't even tell you how much I love my job sometimes. Um, we were lucky enough to have uh, Benjamin Boxiera in conversation with Tommy Orange. He was um, our last year One City, One Book. And that interview just blew my mind. And I planted the seed that I knew he was going to be having a book out in September. And I was so excited to be able to celebrate him. Um, so Mr. Boxiera was raised by a widowed mother and the streets of San Francisco Mission District after serving as a grunt in the Marine Corps where he participated in frontline combat during the first Gulf War. Ben completed his BA in English at UC Berkeley, earned teaching credentials from San Francisco State and merited a Juris Doctor degree from University of California Hastings College of Law. Currently, he is a professor at City College and community innovator, keynote speaker, throughout the Bay Area. Ben's essays and stories have been published in newspapers and literary magazines. His first novel, Barrio Bushido, was presented a Best of the Bay Award and an International Latino Book Award. And he writes the beautifulest, poetic, perfect sentence you've ever seen. It's gorgeous. Check out both of his books. And buy his book tonight. You can buy it and this is from Pacino Press, which has amazing lineup of books. Support your local um, independent press. 
And then we have him in conversation with Luis Rodriguez. Also, my mind is blown. There's books out there that you read that, you know, change, change you. And this is definitely one of them. And um, just opened up a whole nother avenue of books for me. And thank you for being here. Um, Luis Rodriguez is a former Los Angeles poet laureate. He has 16 books out. He's the founder and editor of Tia Chucha Press and co-founder of Tia Chucha's Cultural Center and Bookstore. Rodriguez has two autobiographical accounts of his experiences with gang violence and addiction. It Calls You Back, An Odyssey Through Love, Addiction, Revolutions and Healing, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, and mandatory reading, Always Running, La Vida Loca, Gang Days in LA, winner of the Carl Sandburg Award of the Friends of the Chicago Public Library. His latest book, From Our Land to Our Land, Essays, Journeys, and Imaginings from Native Chicanx Writers, explores race, culture, identity, and belonging, and what these all mean and should mean, but often fail to in a volatile climate of our nation. Um, both of these books and all of, all of um, Luis's books are available at the library and Ben's will be. And I just want to read one more thing that um, Ben had, had emailed. We've been conversating a bit. And he wants to, you know, he just said this thing that was, I thought was really powerful about tonight was, this is an unprecedented opportunity to highlight barrio literature and join the struggles of Northern and Southern California together. In San Francisco, Ben has been instrumental in helping and, and championing the installation of the Alex Nieto mon Monument, the first ever memorial dedicated to someone killed by the police. We will use this monument, this momentum and Peronetta and Luis's work to highlight our common struggles and solutions regarding literature, philosophy, gentrification, racism, educational and economic injustice, and police brutality and killings. And with that, I'm going to turn this conversation over to our two amazing speakers. And... Orale, everyone. Blessings to you all. Thank you, Luis, for uh, joining me here. Uh, uh, blessings and amor to you all. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you all for being here. Um, I just do want to recognize uh, the Tongva Tatavian lands that I'm coming calling from here in Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley. And uh, also want to say hello to uh, all my uh, Chicanex, Mexicanos, um, Guanacos, Chapines, Catrachos in the Bay Area and throughout the, the world, man, because uh, I got a lot of family and friends over in the Bay Area. And so I want to say hello to them, but I know we got calls from all over, but I do want to do a shout out for that amazing community there. I also want to give thanks to the unknown, uh, um, most powerful creator that does not even have a name, you know, right? Uh, beyond words, right? I want to thank you, Luis. I want to thank Pochino Press, the San Francisco Public Library, La San Fran Mission, Portland Street, all of the barrios in San Francisco, the Bay Area, and down south as well. Because like uh, um, Anissa said, what we're doing right now, I think is a beautiful, unprecedented thing. We are joining uh, a north and south audio literature together, right? And uh, I'm just very humbled to be here in conversation with you. As I said earlier, when we were talking earlier today, that this book right here, right? This is always running, right? And this is, I think, one of like the first edition, okay? This was one of the first of books that I taught as a college instructor. And lo and behold, how can it be 20 years later that I am now here in conversation with this great man right now? So thank you uh, for your blessings. I also wanna give a shout out to my Amelia as well, all my loved ones, homeboys and homegirls, homeless homies, uh, et cetera. Gracias. So I guess when uh, you and me should just have a conversation, that's what I understand. And what, we're brother? gonna talk about your work, brother, but, but I do wanna say something. 
Uh, I want to start with um, a line by one of my favorite poets, uh, Theodore Rodkey. And the line is, what is madness but the nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? And the reason why I want to say that is because to me, la vida loca, the life of the streets, that was a way to try to reconcile our, try not to reconcile our soul with the world that was supposedly not mad. You know what I'm saying? The world that was supposedly normal was actually more crazy than the world that we were creating. When we said, when we said La Vida Loca, we were just basically saying, we don't want to be you all, but you guys are crazy. This world of racism, police killings, of schools that don't teach you your history, of being knocked down, of not being able to speak Spanish. That was the world I grew up in and I know you grew up in. And that's where um, the whole culture evolved is where, the, where you think you're crazy? You don't know what crazy is. And then La Vida Loca is that because the soul cannot reconcile itself with that world. The capitalist, you know, imperialist world that we that was created before we even came on. And yeah. that I think is important because of your book, but also of everything. There it goes. Yeah, La Vida Loca. And that's what I think it means. You know, people think what well, it means, oh, I'm just gonna be crazy. I'm gonna shoot anybody I want, I'm gonna kill everybody I want. That happened later. That happened because it got thrown into the, uh, how to say, the turmoil. But our original intent, I say our, because I was there in the 60s when a lot of the stuff was coming. I actually came out before that, the Pachucos, the 30s and 40s, and it even has indigenous roots. In Mexico and Central America, the roots go deep. It's not just, you know, one spot, it's very deep. It goes back to that whole thinking that, that we had, that we should be connected. We should be connected to nature. We should be connected to our own nature. We should be connected to the nature of our relationships and we got to be connected to the divine in our own way, the way we see it. So to me, that was the world that we weren't entering. So to me, La Vida Loca was, now I'm going to take it back. You see what I'm saying? So I want to address that to you because I'd like for you to speak on that, brother, on how La Vida Loca represents for you. Because I've seen it. I see it in your book. I see how you express it. By the way, it's a beautiful book, man. Pochino Press. And I know the brother, the people that are there. They're great people. And uh, this is beautiful. They did a beautiful job. And why not? We just do beautiful books. You don't have to be sloppy. Just make them all beautiful. So this is a wonderful job that they did. And, I, and I'm so glad that you all you are uh, interested in this book because it's not only beautifully done, but the content, the, poet, the poetry, the story, it's mythology and living mythology. That's what it is, brother, is living mythology. So I want you to speak a little bit about what it is that you, why you do what you do. What does La Vida Loca mean to you and how it gets expressed in a, in, in a book like this? All right, so, so hey, thank you so much for asking this fundamental question, brother. And Vida Loca is the root. It, it, it's, it's not that the uh, idea of a sickness, right? Because we also had this concept in the 90s of being sick with it, right? Mm -hmm. Being sick meant very being destructive. You were diseased, right? Mm -hmm. Vida Loca was before that, man. And Vida Loca meant, you know what? There are things we do not understand. There's a spirit world. There, there is education beyond books. There is, there is bravery and courage and destruction and creation. All of it together, man. And it, it's absurd. And what are you going to do in the middle of that vida loca, man? Because as you said, Luis, you're trying to teach us, for example, in the schools. I remember when I was growing up. There was a way that you could structure things to be successful. You could, for example, think about how think about how crazy this is. You could manage time. That's insanity, brother. You know what I mean? The Mayans, the Aztecs, they knew there's no way. You know what I mean, right? And so uh Vida Loca is understanding that there is a rooted natural principle, right? That guides everything, man, that guides the trees guides the ocean, that guides our spirit, right? And uh, uh, it, it was a beautiful thing because I will say this, if you are embedded in Vida Loca, you feel life. Right? There's a lot of people running away from Vida Loca. They're like, oh no, look, Vida is not Loca. Life is structured. Life mm -hmm. is oh, nine to five, you go and get a job for 40 years and then you die. Know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We were like, no, that's that's not the truth. We knew already by about 12, 13 years old, that's not the truth, Holmes. That's simply not the truth, man. I already know that uh, life is about more than that. Mm -hmm. So I gotta say, Vida Loca helped me not 
buy into the lies because there was more truth in the streets, in Las Calles, in the, in the, in the nobility and the love that I saw in brothers and sisters and in teachers trying to make us puppets. And I get it. You know, I, I, I'm a teacher now. So, you know, I, they, 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 they might have had good intentions. Do you get what I'm saying? And so I remember uh, there, were, there were teachers that might have had good intentions, but good intentions for what? Good intentions for me to be a nice little boy? You get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And so I was like, no, we were like, no, we're, we're not going to do that. You know what the repercussions of that was, was that we, we were going to get mass incarcerated. We were going to get killed, you know, and, and we accepted that. We, ex we did not cry about the danger we were entering into, right? You know what I mean? Well, you know, we did cry later. You know what I'm saying? But we took it. And, and, and I, I will say this. How does Vida Loca factor into Buddha Neta and the rest of my life? Is what I've tried to do, what I've tried to do with my life. I, I say this and I, I try to mean it. I live what I write and I write what I live. What I've tried to do is, and I started going to college, right? That was the first time I had gone to really any school since about the seventh grade, you know, right? Once I started going to City College of San Francisco, I used Vida Loca as a vehicle to get critical education. I didn't just sit there, man. I was like, you know what? I got a duty to my homies. I'm supposed to be in here starting some problems. I'm supposed to be in here doing some work, man. And, and you know, it doesn't matter if we're outnumbered. If I'm the only one that looks like me. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna go be who I gotta be. And I'm gonna go explore the craziest analyses of literature that I can, you know? So that's partially how I've tried to use Vida Loca in an educational setting uh, and in my writing too. But I know we're gonna talk more about that as yeah. we go along, brother, please. But, but, but let me just add, I mean, that's, that's powerful, man, because this is a philosophical, people don't think that indigenous people, that brown skinned people have philosophy. We had them before anybody else brought it Cold, yes. right over we were yes. already cosmological we already had thoughts and ideas we had a very grounded understanding of the world and it was trying to take it away from us destroying the books the the books that were you know, the mata paper books destroying the temple destroying everything they could trying to overwhelm it with other uh cultures that were not our culture that were like you point out was patriarchal was linear was was very much uh what i would call the masculine energy devoid of the feminine because you, indigenous people never did that. The feminine was the first energy. It was the primary energy, but you need masculine. But they turned it around. Masculine rules everything. The pragmatic and practical, or you gotta do, gotta take bottom line, you know, take care of business, all the world that we grow into. Because even in the barrio, we weren't into that. Believe it or not, to me, we understood both the feminine and masculine. People think we didn't, but we did. We understood how it all interacted. Being local for me, was just like, I ain't gonna fall. I'm gonna deal with this world on my terms. Because right, what was the alternative? You be quiet, you don't rock no boats, you accept the pain. I could do that. Now, here's what happened though. That's a sad thing, but it's part of the truth. They brought in, we didn't do this. They brought in guns, heroin, later on other drugs. They brought in a lot of things to undermine that uh, revolutionary rebellious spirit. They, they knew that we were from the Pachuco days all the way on down, you know, they knew it. They treated everything they could, but I don't think they de they destroyed it, nor do I think they stopped it. Some of us, some of us, well, I was a heroin addict. I was in the streets. I shot people. People shot at me. I was in the, the warfare, but I also was um, given this imagination by the Chicano activists of those days who came to my barrio and started working with people like me. Now, I'm probably the only one that paid attention, but I, I loved it. It saved my life to know there's struggle, there's, there's social justice, there's change. I was taken by it. I didn't stop li living La Vida Loca. I just changed it into the world of how we're gonna change this world. I'm still local if that's if that's how we wanna put it, I'm still local. And, but now I'm doing it like you say, I'm fighting the system in my way, I'm using my poetry. I mean, the arms for me aren't guns and knives. I don't even have any more guns. I got rid of, I had a lot of guns, I got rid of all of them. Me and my son, my son did 15 years in prison. He ain't got no gun, we ain't got no guns, but guess what? We're still armed. 
We're armed with ideas. We're armed with poetry. We're armed with song. We do mashika. We do dansa. We do all these things. That's how we're just dealing with it. So uh, I just wanted to express that because I think that's what you're pointing out. We got to reclaim what it always was and what it still is with us now. Yes, brother. And you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s, you experienced all of that poison that they were bringing in. And this book, as you know, brother, what happens is, is by the year 2010, oh, 2012, when the beginning of the story takes place, they've used all that attempted destruction to make us bad guys, bad people, so that they have an excuse and a justification to kick us out. Yeah. And then the, the gentry come in. We, are, we gotta understand that idea of gentrification, the root is from this word called gentry, yeah. which is related to nobility and royalty, right? Yeah. And so gentrification is, we got, suppose this is our barrio, right? And then all of a sudden the gentry comes in, the royalty, and they're like, you primitive savages don't know what you're doing with this land right here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we, we are your saviors. We are your saviors. And what specific idea is it that they said is our savior? In the, in the 18th century, in San Framichon, uh, the, that's when it was built, right? Mission Dolores, uh, well, it was a creek, was uh, Dolores, uh, Arroyo de Dolores, it was the missionaries. Missionaries with Jesus, right? With God, right? Okay. In the year two, in the year two thousand ten, the, the uh, rhetoric that they're using, the gospel that they're using to justify our attempted extermination, is technology. Mm -hmm. They're like, technology is efficient. You all, what are you doing? You're barbecuing on the streets. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You're having danzas, etc. You know what? That's not the best way to use this property. And so they actually used hang injunctions. They used demonization of, of, of both brown and black people to justify them coming in. And then all of a sudden, because you experienced it, all of the property, 60s and 70s, is not, is, is not valued to them. But then they want to make believe a number. In the, in the property in the Mission District in the 1970s, those houses were on average worth $30,000 per home. The dirt is the same dirt. Exactly. The, the wood is the same wood in the house. <laughs> How can it be that that house is now worth $2 million? <laughs> it's an imagination by the gentry. The gentry comes in and then guess what? They put push us out, man. They push us out, right? So this is a story about La Sanfra Michon and what people have done to fight against uh, uh, racism, economic, educational injustice, right? Uh, and also against police brutality and police killings, man. So I... Uh... My body was also gentrified, you know. Right. And you can imagine... And when I, just so you know, in the 60s and 70s, when I was there, it was one of the poorest neighborhoods in the whole country. Uh, it, there was a hundred migrant communities in the San Gabriel Valley. There were dirt roads. There were no sidewalks. Chickens and goats in people's backyards, graffiti everywhere. There was little shacks. I got pictures of it. People said, this looks like Appalachia or the South. I go, it was, yeah, but it was worse because it was all dense. There was muddy when the rains came. All the roads were muddy. But we were surrounded by white suburbs. So you could see the difference. One thing, if you're in Appalachian, that's all there is, that's all you know, if you're in the deep south. But man, when you're surrounded by people with sidewalks and strip malls and nice homes and everything else and restaurants, you can see, wait a minute, what's up with this? We're the Mexicans and we're treated this way. Here are the white people. And I'm, I'm not talking about poor white people. There was two or three poor white families in my barrio. And guess what? They were homies. We didn't hate them because they were white. They spoke Spanish just like us. They were homies. They lived in the neighborhood. I'm talking about the class gentry you're talking about, that class nature of I got money and power. And so they used the LA sheriffs as their army. We were at war. I was at war. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. You know how many homies went to Vietnam? But I, they tried to get me when I was in jail. They said, why don't you sign up for Vietnam? And then we'll get all the charges off. I go, I ain't going to Vietnam. I'm already at war. 
I don't need to be a war there. I'm like Muhammad Ali, you know, why am I fighting these, these brown skinned people over there when I'm the brown skin here and the people here are the one messing with me because the sheriff's deputies, they killed four of my best friends. The, and this is in the 60s, dude. In, in other words, it never died, even if it got worse by now, even if it's gotten bigger, we were living that life. There were, there were four of my friends killed by cops and unarmed. I'm not talking about the vatos that were going crazy trying to shoot somebody. I'm talking about the dudes that just happened to be unarmed. The cops killed them. They were my best friends. They're gone. So I had carried that pain too. It was like, well, I'm a way at war. I don't need to go to another war. The one good thing about being given an imagination and a, in a, in a, a vision is, you, is what something you just said. You realize that the world that we're in that is so big and strong, mortgages, your wages, pain, all these things, they're all illusions. Yes. They're yes. all illusions. They're made up. But we think they're everything. Yeah. I know. Even the mass incarceration is an illusion system. Yes, it's real. Yes. People are dying because of it, but it's all made up. They made up how it works, who gets in there, how they set it up. They made up all the laws so that there will be more lawless people. The more laws you make, the more lawless you're going to be. You know what I'm saying? Yes. They find all kinds of ways to hurt kill or and or incarcerate people they just make it all up my white supremacy is a made up thing there's no sustain as white supremacy there's no sustain as white nationalism yes there's people proclaiming it but the root of it is nothing they're proclaiming it they're setting it up they're up the militias can sit in there with arms and everything else but it's like but you're fighting for something that doesn't exist you have to make a stuff up and then you got to make it seem like it's not made up and everything yeah. i am yes. is made up I said, no, no, exactly. and this is what we're addressing. And I think you're addressing in the book because with their story, especially around the gentrification and everything, you're also pointing out that we're not losing the seeds that have been planted and with us since our ancestors. We're still carrying those seeds. You know, in Mexico and Central America and a lot of those countries, close to 95% of the people were killed within 50 years of Spanish and Portuguese coming in those lands. 95%, that's a genocide beyond in genocide. But guess what? That 5% that's, that lasted, that's us, bro. The Me? ones that kept living, us. that yes. kept gathered. And then we're in the barrios and some of us are still fighting that long range war. So I always tell like my son and anybody, my son's clean and sober, he's, he's crime free, no longer bother all that stuff. But I tell him, whatever you do, cause he's always having issues with rage and getting triggered. He has issues with, you know, people not understanding my goal. But whatever you do, just think, what will be worthy of our ancestors? the ones that didn't make it, that died and we're still here. What will be worthy of that 5% that kept living to renew everything we were about? Because that's what we're doing. We're trying to renew and reweave the world that used to be our world before it got invaded. But now we got to do it under these terms, under the world that, that we're living now. Yes, spirit, spirit matters most. Absolutely. It's not intellect, it's not logic, Absolutely. it's none of that. It's spirit matters most, brother. And since you brought up the issue of mass incarceration, I want to talk about something that happens in the book in chapter six. It's on page 134, right? And uh, um, that chapter is called Cartoon Visits Lobo at San Quentin Inca, right? And so Cartoon, the homie, has been gone on an educational odyssey. He comes back after 20 years, man, because Lobo had commanded him to go get an education, young blood, right? And he comes back and he finds out his mentor, Lobo, is in La Pinta for the rest of his life, right? And he has a discussion about how conscious, if he's conscious of what's happening. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to read a little bit about that because you brought up some beautiful points, Luis, that I think are addressed here. So, my brother, our two knew he too was supposed to have been behind the other side of the bulletproof glass. Don't you feel used like a pawn? Cartoon had to engage because he too had read many books and thought about this matter deeply in all the years he had been away. Of course I'm a fucking pawn. Bobo was upset at the stupid question that required him to confess stupid answer. I'm the capital for one of the most profitable money-making institutions in modern history, prisons. 
man. Before they had gente picking cotton or coffee or lettuce. But now they don't even need our muscles, homes. They just throw us in these cages where we play dominoes and spades while they cash in on our spirits. My actual body is their capital, their profit. I feed the guards, lawyers, and judges children and educate them through college so they can then become the lawyers that lock all of our asses up. Bobo laughed, his brown, bald head glistening with sweat. Come on, man. California Prison Guard Union is the strongest prison union in the world. Ain't here to guard us from society. They're here to protect their investment. Me. Yeah. Pura neta, bro. <laughs> Pura neta. So, that's the yeah, truth. That, yeah, that's Pura neta. Exactly. That's what, if you want to read, this is for, because you've already read it, Luis, you know, and it's not really a plug, but, you know, my, my, my whole life, it's dedicated to just spreading love and consciousness, man. And so, you know, yeah. if you want to read more about what's happening, man, but in a, in a fictional and an honest manner, then please come um, check out this book. Yeah. Buy this book, man. You know, teach this book. Put on that, man. Please, yeah. Luis. Yeah, and you know what? I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. As you know, I've been going to the Pintas for yes. 40 years. And I did that because, you know, I was in and out of jails as a youth. I was in juvenile hall. I was in two adult facilities. I got convicted. I'm an ex-offender. Uh, well, I'm formerly incarcerated. Offender is not the right word. But I, I, I did stop all that. And, you know, when I was 20 years old and my oldest son, Ramito, was born, I made a promise. I'm never going back to that, to that craziness. I'm never going back to that craziness, never. to the prison, to the heroin. I quit heroin in, the, in jails and everything. I, I just wasn't going to go back. But I couldn't forget the homies, man. Many of my homies were all getting caught up. I yes. couldn't forget the, the raza, the gente that was stuck in these cages. So about 25 years old, after I worked in industry, I worked in a steel mill, learned a lot of skills, you know, pipe fitting, welding, you know, mechanics. I gave that up to become a journalist. Just like you went to school and you went and got your education. I gave up all that to just, I'm going to be a writer, man. And I did that. And I started going to my first writing workshops in Chino prison in 1980. I was a reporter for San Bernardino Sun and they all gave me an opportunity to come in there to teach creative writing and I did. I've been going to prisons ever since and I've been doing poetry readings, I've been doing talks, healing circles, but also teaching creative writing. I've been at Lancaster prison now since 2007, 13 years now uh, teaching there. And this is the high security level for prison. And so you see all the vatos. You see, I see homies because in every prison, some homie of mine is in a prison somewhere in California. There are a few of them. You see them everywhere I go. They're, they're there. So I've been to San Quintin. I know been to Folsom. I've been to Soledad. Uh, I've been to all these other places. And plus, when I go to Lancaster, some of those guys remember me from 10, 15 years ago when I visited those other institutions. Hey, you, you, I, I was in your class then. I go, oh, that lady. Yeah. I, okay, good. Yeah. I've been doing it so long. But I, I find that to be important. And it's not because I want to uh, teach them how to write while they're in prison. I'm, a, I'm an abolitionist. We got to completely get rid of the whole prison yeah. system, yeah. mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. But as long as I'm in there, I'm trying to give them the keys and liberation that they need now. And that's the imagination. That's their yes. art. That's their gifts. Yes. That's their genius. Yes. Give it to them now. They don't have to be in prison even when the bars are big and the razor wires everywhere. Just like all the dudes who are outside who think they're free, but they're in prison in their own yes. mind. Yes. They got addictions. They got rage issues. They got, the, the, you know, people are out here all in some kind of prison and don't know it. At least the guys in the Pinta know they're in prison yes. and they know they have to figure out a way to deal with that. So I'm giving them, here's the keys of liberation while you're here in yourself. Be imaginative, be creative, write, tell your story. Man, get up. Some of those guys are amazing performance poets, yes. man. They just come up and rattle things out of their words and mind. Like, oh, let's, let's shape that, bro. Let's work with it. So I got a class where it's all black and brown. You know, that's what it is. And people say, well, black and brown can't get along. They're all good in my class, bro. They're all, and you know what? And, and, I, and I don't mind saying it, Norteño, Sudeño, everybody. that comes in my class, they're there to learn. 
Nobody fights. Everybody respects each other. They got protocols. They respect me. I respect them. That's what holds the whole place together. And we don't get into any platos about nothing, but we talk issues. We talk hard stuff. We talk about pain, talk about trauma. We talk about the things that people have done. We talk about how to restore, how to transform, all these great things. So to me, that's why I do what I do. And I'm also out in the streets and I'm also organizing to get rid of the whole mass incarceration system completely because it's, it's, it's completely wrong because uh, people don't recognize that crime is a most made up thing. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, of course. That, yeah. That, that's just a way to oppress poor people even exactly. more, bro. Yeah, you know? so they in my video, they didn't give you much of a choice. You either accepted poverty or you went to crime. That's the way it was. And if you didn't want to accept poverty, I'm gonna, I can't make a living, I can't get a job. People cut, I'm gonna do something. But those aren't the only choices, but those are the only ones they give us. And then, of course, we're okay with going to the Pinta. We, nobody was scared of going to the Pinta. We all accepted it. We we're okay if we die, bullets come get us. We we're okay if we have a hair and overdose. That's part of life. I go, no, no, that is not life. That's something else. That's somebody else's plan that many of us bought into. We played ourselves, some of us, but not everybody did. And we still can be liberated through the arts, creativity, through yeah. writing, through the power. This is why this is powerful. Because this is shows, it shapes the world the way we want to do it. If the world isn't going to give us the tools to shape, um, to do things that they want to do and how they want to do it, we shape it ourselves. Yes. We make our way in this world. We set up our own ways of doing, our own economies, our own social structures. And it's got to be based on something that all indigenous people, because I always go to the indigenous because that's our root. We might have Spanish and a bunch of colonial guys, Anglo assimilation. We've got a lot of things, but I go my deepest root. It's indigenous in this land. Yes. And they knew one thing. Everything they did was for the shared well-being of everybody. That should be what we all aim for. And if you read the Bible, if you read the Quran, if you read Buddhist texts, if you read anything, they all are trying to say the same thing. The shared well-being of everybody is what should be our heritage. And that's what we should struggle for, organize for, fight for, do whatever we got to do to make sure that happens. Yes, brother. Thank you so much for blessing us with that wisdom. Wisdom. Bro. And I do want to say something just about the name, man, because you were talking about imagination and creativity, right? So think about the imagination here. You know, uh, uh, Pura Neta is street Spanglish for pure truth, but this is a book of fiction. So it's already a paradox. Yeah. How can fiction be the truth? In the book, I'm trying to say that, you know what, man? Truth it's not just this thing called truth. Yeah. It is both truth and imagination Absolutely. equals truth, man. Absolutely. You know, right? And something more that you talked about is just the beauty of a writing and also reading. Because you know that if you want to be a writer, you got to read too, yeah. man. Because Absolutely. what happens when you read is you start stealing, man. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, that, that's, what you're, that's what you're supposed to do, Holmes. Everybody you know, takes from me. You yeah. steal and share, right? So I would like to actually read a little bit about the power of reading. And this one comes from a character. His name is Cartoon. And it's on page 57, right? And he writes about uh, um, uh, what, what do you get out of reading, right? And he, said, he says this. <clears throat> By reading, I stole style. Mm -hmm. Reading, I've come to believe, is the key to consciousness. When reading, you gotta shut the fuck up and listen. Do you listen to? What do you listen to? Not even you know, because that voice that enters into your brain is not your voice. You simulate a song someone you ain't never met. You mimic an accent that slurs in your mute mind. You imagine something that cannot possibly be true, yet you listen. And to do that, you must be disciplined, attentive, and creative. Crazy. A cartoon to practice the skill of reading you must be confident in your own 
nothingness. The denser the text, the more complicated and paradoxical the words, the more you must question yourself and your own consciousness. It's a time of dangerous peace and safety that forces you to confront and construct your reality based on someone else inside of your mind. Will you be bullied? Will you submit? Will you find patience and humility to listen to someone besides yourself? Are you exciting to entertain another brain inside of your brain? A taboo point to proclaim. Reading is the most magical message. Man, that is poor, so powerful. Uh, I want to emphasize again what you just said. Um, I was fortunate as a young man that I loved to read books. And people say, well, how can you in the barrio, no book? Nobody loved books in my family. Nobody loved books in the barrio. That gra grabbed me. I didn't know English. I learned English by TV and reading. I just was, I, when the books, remember they used to have those books, I don't know if you used to have it when you were a kid, uh, those books that they were, you can buy them uh, in school. And uh, they would give you a, a list and I would mark them all, my mom, my mom, my mom would say, no, no, no podemos, there's mucho, no podemos comprar libros, no, no, no tenemos para libros. And I would convince her and she would, okay, uno, uno, uno está bien. Okay, so I would always get one little book. But you know what, that was changed my mind. And when I was on heroin, homeless in the streets of downtown LA, and I had a 22 handgun to bug people. I just the way to survive, you know. And I, I came across the Central Public Library, man. And I walked in there, and I thought, whoa, there's books here, man. A lot of homeless people were there just to clean up, maybe to rest. But you know, man, I I spent hours there, man. It was my refuge. I read Malcolm X. I read James Baldwin. I read Ray Bradbury. I read Charles Webb. I read everything, bro. And you know what? That's what you're saying. That gets you thinking yes. because books never beat me up. Books never told me I never amount to anything. Books never knocked me down. Books were always my friends. You know what I mean? In a world that you could die if you make the wrong move. You're, I, I used to not, to, I never slept with anybody or any group. They always invited me. I didn't trust nobody. I always slept in a different place every night, uh, down along the early river, abandoned cars, abandoned buildings, wherever I could sleep, never with anybody. I didn't trust nobody. During the day, I hang with them. I'll shoot up with people, but I didn't want to fucking be. And, but you know what? The books were my saving grace. And that's what eventually got me to think, Maybe I could write books, you know what I mean? Yes. Maybe I could do it, bro. I mean, I, I come has to be just all these other people. So I really believe what you're saying is powerful. That's is why I believe that they don't allow books and education in our schools. Guess what? There's no bookstores in the barrio. There isn't in, in LA. You go to South Central, go to East LA, go to the West Side, go to San Fern, uh, Fernando Valley, the North West Side, the Mexican, Central American side of the valley. There's no bookstores except what me and my wife created. We created a bookstore here for half a million people. The Tia Chucha Centro Cultural and Bookstore is the only bookstore for half a million people. Of course, we have arts, we have workshops, we have danza, we have films. We are the only movie house in Hollywood, the entertainment capital of the world. We got no movie houses here. So we have to create those spaces. We yes. have to create those yes. bookstores. We have to say to people, you need this knowledge get it, we got to provide it for them. So that's why I love what you had to say because I'm honored to have been part of creating the space that's been around for 20 years now. And just by so you know, me and my wife started it, my wife ran it for 17 years. Two years ago, we turned it over to all these young people. Some of them came out of high school with no sense of nothing, they stayed with us. Now they're in their late 20, 30s, mid 30s, late 30s, and now they're running it. Eight staff people, they're running it. It's in their hands. Me and my wife don't do it day by day. We're still there. We're still helping. She's on the board, and I do whatever I can to help. But it's in their hands. We turned it over to them, and it's going beautifully, man. And that's, oh, that's what so I think is, is what you're saying. That spirit, you're saying that spirit has to be. Look, at there's spirit in everything. And there's a spirit in, in life. And there's a spirit in your revolution. And there's a spirit in change. And there's a spirit in books. And there's a sp their spirit is everything that infuses everything. They're not just material things you can touch. 
Everything that you can touch has spirit imbued in it. And we have to bring it out, draw it out, just like everybody else's spirit has to be drawn out. So thank you, brother, for that. And I appreciate you too I, I, for reading because I think what I was saying, this is living mythology because exactly what you said. This is the truth that fiction can tell. Fiction is made up, but guess what? There's truth all throughout it. Yes. And that's what people got to, mythology is like that. Mythology is made up stories, but they carry the truths of our times, of our, what, what messages and metaphors and whatever we need to understand how to live, when to live, what's happening ahead of us. That's what you're doing. You're giving us a roadmap and you're giving us the truth through these characters and these situations. So, I mean, you're, you're living mythology, man. Thank you so much for that, brother. And you know what? Just got to talk a little bit about the cover, man. Because yeah, check out that is a, a rendition by a, a beautiful homeboy, uh, Mateo Leon Valencia. He likes to call himself Metal Metal. But just a little bit. This is our San Fran culture right here, man. Mm -hmm. This is the Bay Area culture, right? This is uh, uh, Rita Calo Catrina, yeah. right? And one of the characters, Maricela. That's her, that's her shero, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And look, so Pura Neta, she's all sassy, she's yeah. down, but she's dead, Holmes. She's yeah. dead, right? Because yeah. that is the truth, that, and it's an imagination. It, death, death is a truth and an imagination because we all believe we're going to die. I think we all know we're going to die, but we have absolutely no idea what the hell that means. Man. No, so no. anything we've ever thought about death it's just pure imagination, man. Yeah. So here she is with the low rider bomba in the back, right on Balmy Alley in La San Framichon, man. Yeah, you know, right? And, 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 you know, I just got to say that, you know, it, this kind of spirit permeates throughout the book as well, man. And, and you said something earlier about feminine and masculine spirits, right? And I wanted to touch a little bit on that, bro, because, you know, in the 19, in the late 1980s and 1990s, because mass incarceration was in full swing at that time, right? All of my homies, my brother was in the pen. They were getting, we were getting killed on the street, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we we made up this bullshit, right? The media is feeding this to us. The uh, um, films are feeding this to us. You know, gangster rap is feeding us. We're supposed to be overly macho, mm -hmm. right? And you know calling women the B words, et cetera, when only 10 years earlier, they were so romantic, man. Oh, yeah. We love the soul oldies, et cetera, right? But we always knew, and the character Lobo talks about this in, later on in the book, but he, I was just fronting, man. We always knew there was a feminine spirit, man. Exactly. We always loved that feminine spirit had more power in many ways than we did. Yeah. We had to try to protect ourselves, man, because we knew, we knew that we were going to get killed, that we were going to go to prison. And if you did not fall in love, then that meant, you know what, then I, I won't be weak when yeah. I'm in La Pinta, man. No, no, you know, no. Right? So, you know, I did want to say a little bit about that because uh, we got some feminine characters in the yeah. book as well. La Mision, yeah. I personified her and made her into La Misión de Dolores. Yeah. He made her into a female character, man. Yes, and she right. tells the story, the history of San Francisco, specifically La Misión uh, uh, de Dolores, man. Yeah. So uh, building on that, man, this is a very important thing. Uh, I will tell you a story. It's in my new book of essays. Yeah. I don't mind telling you, man. Uh, you know, I was a tough dude, man. I would fight everybody. You couldn't mess with me. I was arrested. I did a lot of drugs and stole, but really what I got arrested for was for shooting people, stabbing people, for trying to fight with cops. Uh, I was on murder's row when I was 16. I took on everybody, but guess what? When I was a little kid, I was a sensitive, imaginative kid. I really loved being in the corner, playing with my army men, my trucks. I love, I didn't want anyone to go outside. My brothers were, my brother was like, come on, let's go play outside. I, like, they were always playing dirt cloud fights with trash can lids and everything. And I, you know what, man, I just want to be in my, people made fun of me, you know, like, what's wrong with him? That's not what a boy should do, go out there and everything. And I'll tell you a story, when I was nine years old, my neighbor was a little girl about eight. She was playing dolls on the porch and she invited me to go to play dolls. 
I didn't think twice about it. I had been playing dolls with my sisters. I didn't care. I was in my imagination. So I'm playing dolls with her, two of the little toughies, same age as me, nine years old, but they were walking by, they looked at me. Oh, they snickered, they went walking. The next day, I got hell for it, man. The kids in school were making fun of me. They called me things I never even heard of, faggot? What's that? I don't know. And even Spanish, even worse. You know, the Spanish words, they go like, oh my God. And then they beat the hell out of me in front of everybody. They knocked me down. I was on the ground. That's how I have a jaw. They cracked my jaw. I didn't break it, but they caused a growth. That's why even to this day, I only got three places my teeth meet. I never fixed it. I was called chin from my barrio. That's exactly right. Because the gang embraced my the deformity. Everybody made fun of me. They said, call me monkey. They looked, I looked ugly. Only the gang embraced it. But what happened, I don't want to call it gang, because the barrio was my homies. It was, it was a different thing. But what happened is when I was on the ground at nine years old, I made a promise. I would never again be knocked down by anybody ever. And you know what that did? That was powerful, but it was also a mutation. I stopped being that sensitive kid. I stopped crying. I stopped having an imagination. I just became all about, I'm gonna take you on. You're gonna mess with me? I'm gonna mess with you 10 times worse. I just became this kind of a mad, and I don't mean mad in the sense of what we're talking about. I'm talking about a fractured, distorted, mutated young man. The idea in, that some people were saying, this is what a man is. So I've had to spend my whole life after seven years of drug heroin and then 20 years of drinking. Now I've recovered. I've got 27 years sobriety this year. Same years that I was on drugs and alcohol. <laughs> now I'm finding 27 years. And guess what? I, brought, I found my sensitivity again. I found my imagination again. I found my feminine again. You know what I mean? I'm finding it on a higher level. I'm writing. I, this is to me totally infused with feminine because it's imaginative. It's got emotion, it's got emotional value, it's got stories, but it comes from a place of the heart. It's, that's what makes this story powerful. And so I wanted to say how even in my life, it turned out to be the right thing. My wife always tells me, you know, uh, she sees the one that teaches me these things. She says, the feminine is the first energy, it's the lean energy, it's the constant. The masculine is the variable, it's needed, it's secondary, it's important. You can't do one without the other. But you got to remember the feminine. And even more than that, as you go towards the masculine, when you do things, when you get things done, when you start shaping things, when you do practical things, don't forget the feminine has to be weaved in there. Don't lose the feminine. Don't just go from feminine imagination to now masculine, let's take care of business. You got to weave that feminine all the way through. I just want to give you a, uh, an embrace, brother. <laughs> Damn, yeah, brother. Man, yeah. So much love. I, I, oh. Man, this is so much a wisdom that you're throwing to. down to us. I'm so humbled and so appreciative of this, man. Yeah. And this is so beautiful, bro, that we have this conversation. Yeah. And you know what? We're talking barrio love, brother. That's what it is. Barrio what love, is. bro. And you know what? Yeah. North, South, bro, we're together like this. Yeah. You know what? We're human beings. Somos yeah. indios, bro. Yeah, so. Somos. Somos indios. Together, Somos. bro. We are. We got to do it. And, and brother, I'll say something about that because that, that word is used in the book, Indio, right? Yeah. I got to say, I understand that in Latin America, it's a that, put down. Is a, a, that is a derogatory it's, term, it is. bro. It's a put down. Yeah, yeah, it's a put down. But you know what, bro? I embrace you got that, to. man. I'm you not going to let that strip away my to, natural man. roots and identity, bro. No, you know you what can't. I mean? You know, I feel it. I felt it through my father, through yeah. my brother. May he rest in peace. Through the yeah. streets. Everybody, I, I, yeah. Bro, everybody, like you said yeah. earlier, bro. And see, this is the thing. That, uh, God bless them, bro. You know what I mean? And I don't want to uh, stereotype all white people like this, right? Yeah. But white people are indigenous too, Absolutely. bro. You know what I mean? I think Absolutely. Many, many times people forget their indigenous natures, yeah. bro. Yeah. And that, that, that is a horror story. Yeah. When that happens, bro. Because yeah. then you don't know really who you are, man. No, you have no roots. And therefore, people can make up stuff like you're white. White is nothing. There's yes. no place yes. called, there's no white land. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I get it. If you're Celtic, if you're from Ireland, if you're from yes. Spain, you got beautiful cultures yes. in Spain. Yes. If you're from, and I don't mean the Spanish conquistadors, I'm talking about the cultures. If you're from Germany, there's, I, I got friends. I got a, I got a, 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 um, a sobrina. In, in Germany, she married a German guy. She loves Germany. She's a dark India from La Ciudad de Mexico. She's, you know, but she loves it. It's like, hey man, the world 
The world doesn't divide by nations, only human beings do. And I'm not saying that we're not a nation, but we don't have the borders. The borders are made up. The earth oh, accepts all illusory. of us. There, it is. It's another illusion that's yeah. been set up and we're all falling for it. And we can't now, and I gotta have a passport. I gotta go from one place to the other, but it's like, but the earth accepts us, welcomes us. Doesn't care if you've been in the Pinta, doesn't care if you've been at the Casa, doesn't care what country you're from, what color skin you're from, doesn't care if you're trans or you're queer or you're not. The point is it accepts all of us, doesn't it? When you walk the earth, it doesn't spit you out. It doesn't say, hey, you can't walk here, bro. No, we walk it and it embraces us. Where is that country? Where is that land? Where is that world? Not in the society of capitalism and imperialism that was made up. And now we're all living under this made up illusion that's actually hurting and killing us. Look at that pandemic. Look at all the, all the stuff that they've created. The madness is not in the body, it's in them. They're the craziest mad people because they created a whole world that's all totally off and they're pushing it on us. I, was, I heard that debate last night. Madness, bro. That, they're crazy from both ends. And again, I, I'm not, I, look, I'm, I, if you if people want to vote for Biden because they don't like Trump, all power to you. I'm not, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying anything. But I'm honestly, I'm looking at both of them. And I know Trump is totally fucking nuts. But I'm thinking, look at, but the answer that they got isn't any less it's mad. Exactly. It's the same kind of madness they're both caught up into. And we have to be able to say, let's have another way of thinking, of living, of imagining, another alignment. We can't align with that. And again, I'm, that's okay if you're going to vote for that that's strategy do what you got to do i'm not arguing with anybody about what they got to do but i'm talking about another alignment another way of living and thinking the way that we used to live and think not this way hey brother and i just want to say something about the book at the end of the book by the end of the book with the homie when he goes to go visit him in prison what they decide to do together is not to mm. recruit young homies to be gang members right they go and they decide, you know what we need, you know what's actually necessary. What we need for our own gente is we need amor action yes, in the sir. barrio, That's man. Right, and you know how amor action, how they portray it in the book is, you know what? Go help an abuelita with her bags, huh? Sure, of course. You know, go, yeah. go low ride and give hella love yeah. to all the people that are out there. Go do poetry. Yeah. Right next to the murals. That's right. Right there. You know what I'm saying, right? That's right. And, and, you know, give love every single day. Buy a beer for a homeless exactly. home. If that's what he needs, man. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, 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 Go yeah. buy a slice of pizza, right? The solutions, okay, not to say that we don't have big problems, right. but we make reality too complicated. Yeah. And reality is right now, homes. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're in reality right now, man. And you know what? The best thing we can offer is authentic energy. That's what the it most is. powerful energy that we got yeah. is amor, bro. That's right. Amor, man. No oh, so that's right. yeah. mm. I mean that's that's the that's la vida loca. That's authenticity. That's being present. I uh, understand there's some questions. So sure. I know we don't got too much time, so maybe we can get some of the questions okay. and Sure. Uh, the one that I see is from uh, Al Friedland. Um, it says, in 2012, after Barry Bushido came out, yeah. uh, Senor Baxiera said at a reading that he had invented a new genre, yeah. that of a more literary form of urban fiction featuring homeboys and homegirls, a new, home new mythology. Eight years later, does he still think he's the sole writer of this genre of fiction? Are there others he would recommend besides perhaps Senor Rodriguez? <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, here's here's what I would say. Uh, everybody should create their own genre. Yes. Everybody yes. that writes, like for example, I have friends who say, hey, "I want to, I like your writing. I want to write like you." I said, "Don't write like me, bro." Mm -hmm. And I, I should be the only one doing that. I had a, a Chicano guy in Guadalajara at the book fair there complain, and he didn't know I was in the audience. That he, one of his professors told him, "Why don't you write a book like all we running?" He was pissed off. He go, I don't want to write a book. I go, I don't want to write my book. Which, and I got up and I told him, bro, that's why we fought in the Chicano movement and all the movimientos so that you would write like me. No, so you can write your way, your style, your putting it together, create new genres, forge new ways. And look at that's what I would say. Don't write like me. We're crying out loud. I'm the only one that can barely get to write like me. I can barely do it myself. So the <laughs> idea being that you create your own style, create your own impact. And so I think you're doing this. This is a, a, a innovative, imaginative, completely new style. That is true. But again, 
Other people are doing their their end of it. They're creating their own styles that's coming forward. And that's important so that we encourage people to create their own styles. But there's nobody going to write like este, uh, Benjamin Baxiera. Nobody. You're the only one that does this, and that's the way it should be. So I, I would say, let's encourage that. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, brother. You know, but I, I'm trying to push the envelope. Look at writing in a new way, right? And we haven't even been able to talk about this, Luis. People, Luis, you already know this, man. I am integrating and interweaving both mm -hmm. regular prose and poetry into yeah. a coherent story. Yeah, exactly. I, I got the idea one night after too many shots of tequila, bro. I was like, damn, I got a whole <laughs> bunch of poetry here. I got a bunch of stories, man, maybe I could kind of, and essays, I got nonfiction writing, et cetera. You know, maybe I could just kind of jumble them, jambalaya. And, yeah. and you know, that's yeah. what I did, man. You know, right, that's what, yeah. what I try to do. And, and so sometimes the characters will speak using stanza style poetry, yeah. man. Yeah, I know, you know yeah, I, I saw that and I go, man, this is, that's right, that's exactly right. And there, therefore, it's got rhythm, its own rhythm. It's got its own timing. It develops its own winding way to get to a story and get you into it. So to me, that's powerful. And you got some, besides the fact that you're an authentic vato, you're also educated. And that's powerful. That means, you know, you, you're bringing in knowledge from a lot of other cultures, or, you know, literature, whatever it is, but you're making it your own. And so I would say that's important. Um, there is another question here, and, and maybe... Uh, what steps do you think about getting published and how to get published? And uh, I don't know, you might want to be able to say, I would say that there's a lot of ways to go. I would try all of them, whatever speaks to you. I got published. I did my first book myself. I even typeset it myself. I just did it myself, bro. I was like, hey, you know what? Nobody wanted to publish me. I was sending stuff out. Nobody, you know what? I did it myself. That book made a splash. I was in Chicago. I was part of the slam poetry scene. I was going around selling books out of my trunk of my car. I used to sell other stuff out of the trunk of my car. Now I'm selling my books that I created. And then that's what started Tia Chucha Press. Because then other poets come to you, can you do my book? I started doing all the slam poets in Chicago. And then I started doing other people. And then we started moving. And, and now I got like 80 books from people from all over the country. And I didn't just leave it to our hint. I got a lot of good uh, uh, Lhasa in the, in my collection, but I got African Americans, I got Japanese Americans, I got Native Americans, I got uh, you know Irish Americans, I got, I got wherever I loved, I published. So that's one thing. Do you can do yourself, but there's also a lot of other publishing. I know with like uh, Pochino Press, there are small publishers. They're good. This is a, as good as any. So consider that if you look at small publishers, small theater to press is small. There's others. They do good books. My books are beautiful, just like, that's why I like the artistry of the book. Uh, there's a, many, a lot of them out there. If you don't want to do it that way, there's medium sized, there's university presses, there's other presses, there's medium sized presses. I've been published by all of them, by the way. And I also got the big boys. Simon and Schuster did Always Running and Harper's Collins did my novel and short story collection. I got the big boys behind me. Can I say one is better than the other? No, you want the big boys because they have great distribution. The books get out everywhere. That's a good thing. But they got so many books and I got to pay attention to you like a small publisher might. So you got to take that into account. So I would say whatever works for you, do that. If you got to do it yourself just to make an opening, do that and then try others. Now I got, I got the whole world I can get published by, you know, and I still go to small presses because I think they will take care of my book better than a big one. That's just a decision I make. But I still got big publishers too, you know? So I, I think that's the, the goal. There's a lot of ways to go. There's online publishers. There's a lot of things that people can do to get published. One recommendation that I would have, or a few recommendations is, hey man, you're published all the time, man, with all yeah. this. Every, yeah. you know, the Hagakuri, it's a book, a uh, Japanese text, and I'm just doing it right here. But Hagakuri says, you know what? Whenever you write any word, mm -hmm. any word, what you do is you make those the most beautiful yeah, yeah. words there that you go. can write. As if somebody, you write as if somebody is going to hang that writing up on their wall. Yeah. So if we're talking about publication, whenever you text somebody, whenever you do a social media posting, start a blog, a website, and just write, man. You, you will you will learn your skills, etc., and you will be out there, man. 
You know, you know, I'm I'm going back to what we talked about earlier, Luis. The spirit matters most, yeah. man. So just write what your heart and That's spirit exactly right. tell you to do, man. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, I and I do that with the guys in the in the pinta. I mean, yeah. are these guys not writers? Aren't they creative? Aren't Come they on, geniuses? Man. They yes. are. And so I tell them the same thing. And so there's one question here. Somebody wanted to know whether I was going to do a follow-up to my book, Hearts and Hands. Mm -hmm. Hearts and Hands is one of my most important books. It's a book that summarizes how to work with young people and our world away from the way that the systemic world that we set up is, is not doing it. It's, I wrote it a long time ago, about 30-some years I did working with gang kids, with kids in the jails and juvenile halls. And I was challenging the whole system idea that now everybody's doing. Now everybody's talking this stuff. So hearts and hands is pertinent now more than ever. My son, you know, the, my Ramiro, he says it's the, his favorite book of mine. Cause he says that you got, you, you wrote about this stuff before anybody else did. I don't think I did. But the point is, I think that book should be read by more people. Hearts and hands comes from Gualique, comes from the the, the mother energy, the feminine energy that Mashika's put out there, the energy feminine that was the whole universe Gualique, and she had hearts and hands on her imagery. And I use it as that that's how you mentor and teach and guide young people. You use your, your heart, you connect with them at this level. And then you use your hand to guide them, to teach them, to give them skills, give them resources. Well, when I was mentored out of the gang, uh, the gang life, I don't mean their body or life, I mean the gang craziness, mm -hmm. heroin. It was by a, a guy who didn't try to save me. He, I wasn't saved by him. He gave me the skills, knowledge, connections, and tools I needed to save myself. That's how you do it. You give young people what they need. You save yourself. You make your way. And that's what I think uh, Hearts and Hands is about. So I do uh, hopefully recommend that people read it. I did reprinted it, and it's been uh, out there. We might do a follow-up because now things are changing so fast. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to keep writing. Um, I'm 66 years old, man. I'm 66 years young. I'm sober now, 27 years. My health is better than it's ever been. Uh, and so I'm like, you know, dude, I'm, I was telling you earlier before uh, before we got on that I'm jump roping, man. I'm doing jump rope. Six, yeah. six, I used to be amateur boxer. That's what I did. Now I'm jump roping every morning. And that keeps me going. So my thing is we still could be strong. We still could be sharp. Yes. All those diseases and things are diseases of this society, this world. And we can fight it by trying to be whole and healed and strong in ourselves. Keep that energy, keep that spirit strong and the rest of it will follow. Oh man, thank you so much, man. This is game, yeah. this is game. Gracias, bro, yeah. gracias, man. You know, so, oh, yeah. what, you know, I, I see one right now. What's your favorite oldie? <laughs> so you know what, I, when I say this, you guys are gonna say, oh, I'm doing I expected yeah. it, but I always like Smile Now, Cry Later by Sammy oh, the Sunlight. Sammy Ozuna, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I love that, and it's still good. I think it came out like in 63, 1963, yeah, yeah. but it became the theme body for all the body of life, Smile yeah. Now, Cry Later. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, there's consequences to what you do, yes. and it's part of what I call even restorative justice is in there, because listen, you know, if you're going to do some hurt, you got to find a way to make it right. You got to find a way to have a, a query those agreement with whoever you took from wherever you let's make an agreement to make this right. You don't have to put them in prison. You don't have to lock them down. You don't have to keep punishing them. You have to get them to restore themselves and who they are and their own idea of where they're aimed at. So moving in that direction with community, community being part of it. So that's what I think uh, Smile Not Cry Later really means because, you know, it just means there's, there's there, everybody knows there's consequences. I don't mean punishment. Punishment is not consequence. Consequences can include eating. You know, so anyway, I think we're getting close to the end, brother. I, I think so, bro. I think yeah. so, man. And it's been a great it's journey great. with you, bro. Thank you. Thank La, you Lacho for spreading the Gracias, word. Gracias, man. Lots of love, bro. Amen. Lots of love, man. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you and all, gracias everybody. everyone for showing up. And yeah. I, you will see me on the streets very soon with these books on my trunk. <laughs> There you go. There well, you go. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. We, we Bye, everybody. We put the link that you could buy the book so you can get 30% off till tomorrow. And we are having a book club of Peranetta on October 26th. Join us for the discussion. Okay. And I got starstruck in the beginning. I apologize. Don't forget to take your census and don't forget to vote. There you go. So right. I am so right. honored. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. I am Thank so you. happy.
And thank right, you, uh, community, for being here. We 